Is CPTSD the same as PTSD? Do children experience mental health issues? Is it possible to prevent or treat mental health conditions or disorders? Is taking care of mental health only for people living with mental health conditions? Today, I want to debunk common mental health myths as we end May, which is Mental Health Awareness Month. Hi, I am Raisa a survivor of narcissistic abuse, and I have complex post-traumatic stress disorder. And you are listening to Hello Trauma Brain, a podcast where I share my experiences living with complex PTSD. My hope is this podcast can help destigmatize mental health and provide support to anyone diagnosed with CPTSD who thinks they might have it or has a loved one with this diagnosis. Quick reminder, I am not a licensed psychologist or mental health care professional, and this podcast is not meant to replace nor substitute the care of psychologists, other mental or medical health care professionals. If you think you might have complex PTSD or PTSD, please reach out to your primary care or mental health care provider. Any individuals and resources mentioned in this episode are not sponsoring Hello Trauma Brain. This episode may reference abuse, trauma, and suicidal feelings or ideation, and listener discretion is advised. Remember, you can always pause or skip this episode at any time. And now, let's get back to the episode. Hello, dear survivors, and welcome to this episode of Hello, Trauma Brain. Thank you for joining me today. If you are listening on YouTube, a gentle reminder to hit the like button and subscribe to let me know this episode was helpful. Quick check in. Let's talk about what happened a few days ago. I'm a big advocate for being transparent um, as much as I can uh, with healthy boundaries. And this comes from a place of uh, a lot of the abusers in my life. Uh, transparency wasn't a thing there. Usually in abusive uh, relationships, secrecy is a big thing. And that can look like hiding things from you. Uh, they might not disclose full uh, the full details about things. Uh, it might look like when something happens, uh, telling you not to tell anybody. And this is something that I, I carried a little bit in the toxic way where I would ask people not to say anything either. And um, I'm learning. I'm learning from that. And though there are some things that, you know, it's, it's, it's okay to have privacy and whatnot. You know, I'm, I'm really talking about the toxic aspect of this, the toxic aspect of, you know, don't tell people uh, when something is happening or you can't, uh, you can't tell your version of the story because that, that's not going to look good and things of the sort. And um, I try to be transparent because um, in toxic uh, in toxic relationships and as someone who's recovering from being in those the secrecy is a thing and also acting like nothing happened not only can't you tell anybody else what's happening but when we interact we're going to come from a place of we're gonna act like nothing happened like it's another monday night like it's another day of the week and nobody's gonna talk about this sh- show that happened yesterday because nobody's going to address it nobody's going to validate it and nobody's going to do anything about it and in the spirit of not doing that not hopping on here and uh pretending like nothing happened uh because something did i went through a crisis a few days ago and in fact if you follow the podcast on instagram you probably already know what i'm referring to because i went in there to to talk about uh, basically to reflect on uh, real time, <laughs> mind you, about how mental health and physical health are treated differently. And before I, I dive a little bit more into that, because that kind of goes into what the episode today is going to be about, um, I will say uh, I did have a crisis. I did have, uh, I, I'm going to call it the emotional flashback from the century uh, in it, it got so bad to the point where I really got, it got dark. It got really dark and I was really exhausted and I was really having a hard time seeing how 
how can I live like this? You know, like I'm doing a lot of work and I'm doing a lot of healing. And when, when I found myself in that position last week, it really felt like no good can come and I'm wasting my time. And if you feel like that, if you feel like that at all during, during your life, during your journey, as you go through, what, what, what do you go through? Um, I, want to, I want to share what I did and encourage you and invite you to do the same. Because when, when we're in that place, it's so dark and it's so helpless and it's so hopeless. And that is exactly the moment when we need to talk to people. That is exactly the moment when we need to engage with something else. And what I did was... And interestingly so, I didn't consider it like something that merited a safety plan, but because I noticed um, I noticed I was going in a really bad place and I was having a really hard time, I kind of started doing the steps anyway, in a way. And it was interesting how this went down because some of the things that I was experiencing, I was like, oh, these are signs I need to put in the plan. And I kind of I took it from that place. I kind of went into that place of like, I wasn't opening the plan because I notice that I needed it it was more of like oh these are warning signs let me put them there and then I started reaching out to people so I kind of was doing the plan but I wasn't quite conscious of what was happening because and quite frankly I think the reason I didn't treat it like I need a safety plan right now was I felt in crisis but I didn't feel in danger if that makes any sense so what I did was I reached out to my therapist I reached out to some people that I know and I I started asking for help because quite frankly, it was not so much about, you know, feeling in danger of like my life being in danger, but in terms of like, I need to do something about this particular situation that's putting me in this really horrible mental state. And I reached out to my therapist who had forgotten to turn off notifications before she left for the holiday and was able to get back to me. And we ended up having a phone call session. That was the first time I do a full phone call therapy session with her like that. And um, she was extremely helpful. Oh my gosh, a somatic experiencing work for me like a charm. And it looked a little bit like her asking me, how does it feel in your body? Where is it in your body? Like if you could ask a part of your body, what are you trying to tell me? You know, what would it say? I know you're trying to protect me, but it doesn't feel like protection right now. And um, I, I, I sat through, I'm, I'm following her, her guidance through all this, and I'm f***ing bawling, I'm bawling, I'm crying, I'm uh, a lot of release. I almost fell asleep, I'm going to be honest, and I told her that. <laughs> I almost fell asleep a few times during the session because I was just so, like I, I, I went in it in a crisis and I got out of it feeling very relaxed in many ways. And um, we have a plan for exposure therapy for the bug phobia that I have. And I'm working on that as best as I can. <laughs> I'm not going to lie. The avoidance is real. Um, but I, I have, I went out of that session feeling like I have a plan. You know, there's an evidence-based method that, you know, modality that I can use for the phobias exposure therapy has a lot of a lot of resources that backs it up and I'm going to trust it I'm going to trust that I'm going to trust the plan we have and I I will say my body felt better and I was able to get together with people that day and I ended up you know grabbing dinner eating ice cream and watching light music and it felt great it felt great to be able to go out and and just still do the thing even though I felt exhausted, even though I still felt pretty drained from what happened. Um, and this occurred to me today when I was talking to someone. I suffer from the mood-dependent behavior thing. So for me, sometimes, I, if I am not in a good mood, if I am not positive, if I am not in the right mindset, I can't do the thing. And here's the thing. In order to grab dinner with your friends... In order to get some ice cream, in order to watch some live music, in order to attend whatever, there is no prerequisite that you need to be in the perfect, right, positive mindset. You can show up as you are. And if anything, if you're not in the right mindset, that might be the best thing you can do to get out of your head, to get distracted for a moment. And 
it really helped. And then I decided to impromptu, because it's a holiday weekend in the U.S., it's Memorial Day, and I'll, I'll take a moment to say that, you know, I, I want to honor and acknowledge the people that we've lost, that have fought for, for this country in, in so many ways. And because of the holiday weekend, I quite frankly, it just, you know, I have a long weekend, but I didn't have any plans whatsoever, except for that get together with my friends right at the beginning of it. And the rest of the weekend was just going to be like up in the air. But I thought, let me look, let me look for something to do. Let me look for a festival. I wonder what's, what's going on. Because quite frankly, and this is something I need to work on, if I am not booked to go to the thing to sing, I just don't go. I don't go out. Like the only reason I've, I've attended many festivals around the area is because I got booked to, to sing there. And it's, it's work. You know, you get there, you set up, you sing, you pack up your stuff and you leave. And uh, I have in the years like added like maybe arriving a little bit earlier or staying a little bit later and enjoying what, whatever the event is, which is nice. But here's the thing, when you have a gig, it changes the dynamic of the thing. Like, let's just say I find something I really enjoy. Well, you know, if I need to start setting up in 10 minutes, I'm going to have to leave. This time I was like, let me look for something. And I found this arts festival and I went and I loved it. Oh my gosh, I had such a good time. I had such a good time. I went I got food there. I watched some really good live music. I saw so much art. Beautiful, creative. I mean, the people that I, that I got to talk to about their process, impressive artists. People that, wow. I mean, just when you think you've seen all types of art and you think you know everything that's out there, here comes a vendor and holy moly, are they f- amazing at what they do and I wish I had the money that I that I needed to buy the stuff that I was seeing and the arms to carry it back to the car man what a, what an experience that was and I really forgot for a bit I mean it was in and out my intrusive thoughts were were there like oh you know very soon we're gonna go home and here we go again but oh my goodness just to have to have a few hours or a few pockets of time in there where I just felt like a normal human being going about a festival <laughs> wow and it hit me on the way back I was I was crossing the bridge back to the parking lot and I started crying because as I was crossing that bridge it, I remembered where I was two days before that and I was like wow back then I couldn't see myself living like this like living and what, what's the point you know that those, those were the thoughts going on and as I was crossing that bridge I thought this is the point this is the reason to stay. This is the reason to fight so hard to make it to the other side. Like, I would have not experienced that had something happened to me. I, I deserve to have those moments of happiness, of those moments of joy, those moments of, of you know, moving my body to awesome funk music. You know? <laughs> Enjoy the taste of delicious food. You have to talk to a human being that is sharing their talent so vulnerably and so beautifully. Those moments, it's, it's, it's worth it. And it's, it baffles me every time when I get to the other side of, of the crisis and I'm like, gosh, I'm feeling better. Wow. You know, why, why can't I remember what this feels like when I'm in it? And it's, uh, yeah, it's, 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 it's an unfortunate thing that the brain, brain does, that the nervous system remembers the old thing the, the 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 overwhelm of the despair of having to figure out things on your own and not having the resources and then ah oh, you just get you get stuck it's like really getting stuck in a glue and and wow is it hard and uh, I want to I want to thank all of you that reached out that commented that that said something that showed me your support in one way or another you know uh it really meant a lot to me and it reminded me that I I am loved and people care. People care and they want to show up and you know as much as I carry so much shame about having all these irrational fears of insects <laughs> and how it really messes with my life. I have to say that I am yet to be met with judgment and shame 
And I want to go ahead and continue with what today's episode is going to be about, which is debunking mental health myths. And I want to start off actually with one I didn't write on my script that is coming now, which is related to the Instagram post, which is the myth that only people that look sad are experiencing mental health uh, symptoms or conditions or disorders. And the ones that are smiling and happy and who look like they're striving in their life are doing great and they got no mental health issues. That could not be further from the truth. This weekend, when I was in a parking lot in a crisis with my therapist on the line, it was quiet. You saw people walking by my car. You know, I was bawling my eyes in there, but it was it was quiet. It was there was no sirens. There was no ambulance coming in. It was uh, it was a crisis that was dealt with, but it was dealt in such such a quiet way. And I looked across in the parking lot after my session and I noticed that during our session at one point I don't know when it happened because I really didn't hear the the sirens at all there was a cop car an ambulance a rescue team uh, somebody got uh, taken out on a stretcher I called it a bed on the Instagram post but it was, just, it was like I think it's the stretcher that's what they call it and they got taken in the ambulance and then the sirens were, were going off to take them to the ER and you know it really hit me hard like when there's a physical health emergency it's loud it's so loud the response is big the response is proportionate to the severity of the emergency and you cannot say the same thing about mental health I was dancing a few hours later and nobody would have known that I was not in a good place earlier that day just because someone is smiling and looking okay doesn't mean they don't have something inside of them that feels like war And we need to start acknowledging that. We need to start recognizing that. We need to stop assuming that smiles and productivity outcomes are an indication of good mental health because not necessarily. Now, another uh, myth that I want to debunk, this is one of my own, is uh, that CPTSD is not real. Gosh, I remember one time I was in a meeting with someone in the the field. Forget what their training or, or degree was, but I remember... Being in the meeting with this person, and I had I had just disclosed that I, um, I was involved in a meeting about you know healing CPTSD, and and I basically by by saying that I I was disclosing I have it, and I remember them saying, yeah I don't believe in CPTSD, I don't think that's a thing. <laughs> I was so taken back, and uh, <laughs> I didn't go around the. The setting wasn't allowed for me to like really go at it with this person, but what I did, um, I remember what I did say was like I I will I will recognize and I will I will acknowledge that it's not in the DSM, but um, that was the extent of uh, me saying I'm gonna agree to disagree. Like sure, it's not in the DSM, but let me tell you, and this is what I wish I would have said to this person back then if I um, would have not been in in a bit of a trauma response that froze me. It is a thing. CPTSD is so real and I have it and I know people that have it and quite frankly I think there are a lot of people out there who have it and do not know it and I was one of those people for many years and let me tell you when I sometimes I talk to people and I'm like man I I I think you should look into this you know and um, I don't always say that but in my mind I'm like gosh this is severely undiagnosed and though it is not recognized in the United States in the in the manual that they use here for diagnosis, the, the the DSM, it is recognized in the international manual. So it is recognized internationally. And in fact, many professionals in the U.S. do recognize it is a thing. And they're pushing towards adding it as a diagnosis. I actually know of a petition that I signed that was started by Complex Danny and her healing and CPTSD platform on on social media, on Instagram specifically. And I am going to link that to the show notes in case you are interested in signing the petition. And the petition is to get the DSM to recognize complex PTSD. And it outlines all the reasons and there's there's many reasons, but to throw my uh, some, some of the ones that I, I really believe in is and I've talked about this throughout the podcast, like not having the diagnosis can lead to mistreatment, 
and it can lead to people feeling shame and guilt over symptoms that make so much sense given the trauma they've been through. It can lead to a misdiagnosis. It can lead to um, funds not being given to researchers to look into this because it's not recognized. Like we, we really need this recognition. It's important. We need the resources. We need the research. We need, we need the people in the field to not say things like, I don't believe in CPTSD. I don't think that's a thing. Like that needs to be addressed. It's important. It's serious and it's causing a lot of issues and um, people are suffering. People are suffering, me included. It's, it's hard. It's really hard. And for those of you that are newer to the podcast, there are episodes I've devoted to uh, CPTSD. Episode 2, What is Complex PTSD? And episode 12, um, The Symptoms of PTSD and CPTSD. Um, go over the differences uh, between complex PTSD and PTSD. You know, to, to give you some of the main, the main differences is that uh, the length of the traumatic events uh, can differ for these diagnoses. And also uh, with complex PTSD, you get the emotional flashbacks. And some other things that I will mention as I go through more myths to debunk. Now, the following myths I want to debunk, uh, these are coming from the Substance Abuse and Mental Health Services Administration, which I will refer to as SAMHSA. So the first myth is, Children do not experience mental health issues. Now, the fact is, according to SAMHSA, even very young children may show early warning signs of mental health concerns. These mental health conditions are often clinically diagnosable and can be a product of the interaction of biological, psychological, and social factors. Half of all mental health disorders show first signs before a person turns 14 years old and three quarters of mental health disorders begin before age 24. Unfortunately, only half of children and adolescents with diagnosable mental health conditions receive the treatment they need. Early mental health support can help a child before problems interfere with other developmental needs. They even have a link for resources to start the conversation early in this, uh, and I will link the, the page where all these are. And I'm going to throw in there, I, I started I started noticing my anxiety and my OCD when I was even younger than 14. I want to say maybe eight, eight, nine years old. And going through all that undiagnosed without the resources, without treatment, it, it really made my life very hard. So uh, I, can, I can vouch for children experiencing mental health issues because I did as a kid. The next myth is people with mental health conditions are violent. According to SAMHSA, only 3% to 5% of violent acts can be attributed to individuals living with a serious mental illness. In fact, people with severe mental illnesses are over 10 times more likely to be victims of a violent crime than the general population. You probably know someone with a mental health condition and don't even realize it because many people with mental health conditions are highly active and productive members of our communities. The next myth, people with mental health needs, even those who are managing their mental health conditions, cannot tolerate the stress of holding down a job. According to SAMHSA, people with mental health conditions can be just as productive as other employees, especially when they are able to manage their mental health condition well. Employers often do not know if someone has a mental health condition, but if the condition is known to the employer, they often report good attendance and punctuality, as well as motivation, good work, and job tenure on par with or greater than other employees. And I will throw there that, you know, I have CPTSD and I have been able to keep my jobs and, and for years. And this is, you know, before I started treating it properly and, and as I have been healing. I will say, though, that uh, the healing has made um, my ability to, to do my job easier and it has helped in, in many ways. Next myth. It is impossible to prevent a mental health condition. According to SAMHSA, prevention of mental, emotional, and behavioral disorders focuses on addressing known risk factors such as exposure to trauma that can affect the chances that children, youth, and young adults will develop mental health conditions. Promoting a person's social emotional well-being leads to higher overall productivity, better educational outcomes, lower crime rates, stronger economies, improved quality of life, increased lifespan, 
and improved family life. Now, the following myths are from a Reddit thread I found on debunking harmful myths on CPTSD and PTSD. Myth. Complex PTSD is just PTSD light. According to this thread, the difference between PTSD and complex PTSD is not one of intensity but is rooted in the different nature of the trauma sustained. PTSD is caused by exposure to a single or multiple but isolated life-threatening occurrences. Examples of this include sexual assault, physical violence, a natural disaster, or a car accident. And there can be many, many ways, honestly, that PTSD can develop. Now, complex PTSD is caused by prolonged trauma repeated over months or years. Additionally, complex PTSD is often but not exclusively associated with trauma occurring during the developmental phase. Examples of complex trauma include child abuse, torture, long-term imprisonment, enslavement, and domestic violence. Both these types of trauma are severe and disrupt the fear regulation system, triggering a fight or flight response and lasting changes in the brain. I will add that there there are more trauma responses like the fawning or the freeze. And at one point I remember hearing somewhere that there's like many, many other responses or trauma responses. They're just, these four are the most common. Now back to what the Reddit thread says, CPTSD shares many symptoms with PTSD, but often presents additional symptoms in the areas of emotional regulation, sense of self, and interpersonal relationships. Next myth, only combat-related trauma is a legitimate cause of PTSD. According to this thread, it is estimated that between 10 and 30% of veterans suffer from PTSD, and their source for this was uh, VA.gov. Now, in this thread, they recognize as a community that they want to offer empathy and support to the many veterans who struggle with PTSD, including those whose trauma is rooted in active combat and those who experience military sexual trauma. That being said, war is not the only experience that causes PTSD. According to the U.S. Department of Veteran Affairs, PTSD is a mental health problem that some people develop after experiencing or witnessing a life-threatening event like combat, a natural disaster, a car accident, or sexual assault. Now, the following myths I'm going to go over are from UNICEF Parenting. Myth. You only need to take care of your mental health if you have a mental health condition. Fact. According to UNICEF Parenting, Everyone can benefit from taking active steps to promote their well-being and improve their mental health. Similarly, everyone can take active steps and engage in healthy habits to optimize their physical health. Kind of goes back to something I talked about in the podcast recently, actually uh, last week's episode, which is prevention is key. You do not need to wait to be a high-risk patient to start taking care of yourself. Just like for physical health, you have your annual, so you go to your uh, general practitioner or primary care doctor, depending where you live and what that type of doctor is called. Um, same goes for mental health. I think I think everyone should, you know, at one point or another, seek therapy uh, and and take care of their mental health. You know, you don't need to be struggling to to look into taking care of your mental health and taking steps to improve your life. Myth. Nothing can be done to protect people from developing mental health conditions. Fact. According to UNICEF, many factors can protect people from developing mental health conditions, including strengthening social and emotional skills, seeking help and support early on, developing supportive, loving, warm family relationships, and having a positive school environment and healthy sleep patterns. The ability to overcome adversity relies on a combination of protective factors and neither environmental nor individual stressors alone will necessarily result in mental health problems. Children and adolescents who do well in the face of adversity typically have biological resistance as well as strong supportive relationships with family, friends, and adults around them, resulting in a combination of protective factors to support well-being. Next myth, a mental health condition is a sign of weakness. If the person were stronger, they would not have this condition. Fact, according to UNICEF Parenting, a mental health condition has nothing to do with being weak or lacking willpower. 
It is not a condition people choose to have or not have. In fact, recognizing the need to accept help for a mental health condition requires great strength and courage. Anyone can develop a mental health condition. I could not agree more with that paragraph right there. Next myth. Adolescents who get good grades and have a lot of friends will not have mental health conditions because they have nothing to be depressed about. Can you hear the invalidation on that one? Fact. According to UNICEF Parenting, depression is a common mental health condition resulting from a complex interaction of social, psychological, and biological factors. Depression can affect anyone regardless of their socioeconomic status or how good their life appears at face value. Young people doing well in school may feel pressure to succeed, which can cause anxiety, or they may have challenges at home. They may also experience depression or anxiety for no reason that can be easily identified. I'm going to throw my two cents in on this one. I had a really good GPA in school. I got scholarships. I did well in college. I, I graduated cum laude and with a bunch of honors. And I had undiagnosed CPTSD and was dealing with depression, anxiety, OCD symptoms, and a bunch of other stuff that was just wrecking my mind. So yeah, no, if you would have looked at my GPA and my school performance, you would have never known. And quite frankly, I, that's why I fell through the cracks. A lot of people didn't know because they saw me, quote unquote, doing well. Next myth. Bad parenting causes mental health condition in adolescents. Fact. According to UNICEF Parenting, many factors, including poverty, unemployment, and exposure to violence, migration, and other adverse circumstances and events, may influence the well-being and mental health of adolescents, their caregivers, and the relationship between them. Adolescents from loving, supporting homes can experience mental health difficulties, as can adolescents from homes where there may be caregivers who need support to maintain an optimal environment for healthy adolescent development. With support, caregivers can play an essential role in helping adolescents to overcome any problems they experience. I want to add something, in, and it's coming from a place of I don't want to invalidate the fact that bad parenting can cause mental health conditions in adolescents. That can be a factor, but it's not the only factor, and that is, that is the debunking that I want to highlight here. There could be other aspects too. Now, the last myth I want to go over is actually one back from the SAMHSA uh, website, which is, there is no hope for people with mental health issues. Once a friend or family member develops a mental health condition, they will never recover. This could not be further from the truth. And according to SAMHSA, the fact is, studies show that people with mental health conditions get better and many are on a path to recovery. Recovery refers to the process in which people can live, work, learn, and participate fully in their communities. There are more treatments, services, and community support systems than ever before, and they work. Now, I hope you have found these debunked myths helpful and that you have learned something new about mental health. In this week's healing invitation, I want to offer you a few things to reflect about. What do you know about mental health? Did any of these myths being debunked teach you something new about mental health that you did not realize? What was the message you received about mental health growing up and or as you've come into adulthood? Is it shamed? Is getting help encouraged? I invite you to keep an open mind and challenge anything you've been told so far. If you are listening to this episode, you are already engaging in learning, and I invite you to continue and share this episode with your loved ones. Please let me know how this week's healing invitation goes if you choose to accept it. Before we wrap up this episode, all music and production is courtesy of yours truly. Also, I want to share a few ways you can help support this podcast. You can subscribe and leave a five-star review on Apple Podcasts, Spotify, 
Amazon Music, or the platform you are using to listen. Share this episode with anyone you can think can benefit from this content. Follow Hello Trauma Brain on Instagram with the handle at Hello Trauma Brain. Subscribe to the Hello Trauma Brain YouTube channel and hit the notification bell to be the first to know when I post a new episode. And you can make a donation by getting me a coffee through the official bio site. No worries. All links will be provided in the show notes. Thank you for joining me today. I hope you found this episode helpful. I wish you the best as you continue learning and creating awareness about mental health. It is time for our farewell affirmations. You are welcome to repeat after me. I am enough. I am lovable. And I deserve to heal. I wish you a gentle week and thank you for listening.